Hi, welcome to Darkwood Brew. I'm Eric Elmas, your host, and Darkwood Brew is that place where we combine modern interactive web technology, jazz, arts, biblical scholarship, and well, you never know exactly what's going to happen. So do the words fun, deep, creative, wild, and God go together in your mind uh, very smoothly or in your life? If not, you may have particular interest in this following series. Or if the words stuck, bored, exhausted, or anxious about the future, or in need of options, fit a bit too seamlessly in your life, you may also have particular interest in this series in which we are going to be tracing uh, the outlines of how to live a more creative life and a more spiritually engaged life. Many people don't realize that the very processes by which we uh, develop creativity in our lives are actually, actually match quite closely ancient principles for spiritual discernment. By sticking with us for the, for the next six weeks, you may discover uh, that if your life is overly narrow, that it will open out into a more expansive territory. You may discover a flattened life, uh, reviving into a more three-dimensional experience. And you may find ways to uh, discover and live into your sweet spot or calling in life. You know, there's never been a time perhaps in human history where we have needed to, uh, to experience, uh, uh, to, to be creative uh, and to be more deeply spiritual. The last five generations of human beings on planet Earth have experienced far deeper change on a far greater variety of level than the previous 200 generations. In the last many years, we have been asked, well, no, required to get creative, to deal with all the shifts, all the deep shift going on. You know, it's a lot of stress sometimes. We can feel overwhelmed. You know, ministers aren't immune from that sense of being overwhelmed. 
I remember uh, back in uh, 1995, stepping into the ministry for, for the first time in Scottsdale, Arizona. I had spent eight years studying diligently at Princeton Theological Seminary, learning a particular model uh, for ministry that I was convinced if I could learn well, would make the path to ministry easy, only to discover in 1995, as I stepped step ground in Scottsdale, Arizona, that half of what I learned was already obsolete. Now that's no knock about the seminary I came from. That's been a universal experience amongst ministers. So I was eating stress and anxiety for breakfast. But I'm no longer as stressed as I was uh, in 1995 about the deep shifts going on in our world. For one thing, I've learned that not all change is bad. In fact, some change is quite good. If you look at the, the context of world history, in fact, you, you find that when the Holy Spirit seems to have been really trying to uh, work deep change into society, that really those changes uh, can be painful at times, especially at first. Whenever God is trying to break in new awareness, God's got to break the little boxes that we put around ourselves and God at the same time. We need to get creative. And when we do, we discover a spiritual path that leads to a broader horizon. Well, joining us for this series is uh, Cincinnati artist, musician, and Presbyterian minister, Troy Bronsink. Uh, Troy, uh, we met Troy for the first time in August of 2012 at the Praxis 21 conference in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And his wise words about living a creative life, as well as his extraordinary music, have been on heavy rotation in our minds ever since. So when we considered uh, putting together a series on living the creative life, we thought uh, of no better person to bring on board with us than Troy. Troy will be uh, with us for all six weeks of our series, so you'll be, uh, he'll be walking us through a six-fold process for developing creativity in our own life uh, and listening more closely to what God has to say about our lives and our interactions with the world. So before we go any further and step into our series, uh, let's invite the Bruise Brothers to step us into the program. Well, tonight we have a couple of passages from uh, the Bible that will be also uh, enlivening our conversation, one from the Old Testament book of Joel and the other from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Uh, Tracy Hoverson's here to introduce that. We're going to change up our Numa Divina readings of these passages a little bit. We, we always feature them at the front of the episode, and then we'll turn to a portion of the readings a little later on and, and explore them more contemplatively. Uh, but we have, uh, we're changing the process up to involve you in it. We're inviting you, our viewers, to uh, read a passage that's upcoming. If you signal your desire, we'll be in contact with you. And featuring your creative approaches to the scripture passage as, at the front of our episode. So Tracy, uh, who do we have uh, this week reading? Well, this week we have uh, our uh, well-known to our brewers, Carol Rogers. Mm. Carol recently moved back to Omaha from Los Angeles, where she had traveled for 25 years with Brazilian musician Sergio Mendez and his band. And uh, Carol teaches vocal technique and also performs here locally uh, and in the region. And uh, Carol, Carol threw us for a loop this week. <laughs> we asked for a creative video, um, and, uh, and we received something that uh, 
we were surprised at. So, so this is Carol listening to herself reading the passage on her computer. It is. It is. It's a, it's a very unique presentation of the, our Numa Divina for this week. So let's take a listen together. From Joel. Then afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And from Luke. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Oh, throwing pastors <laughs> off cliffs, I don't know. Yeah, it's bad, bad news bad when that news. happens. That's a bad day. <laughs> we were talking about dreaming this week and dreaming was the main point of our creativity question that we had on the question of the week mm. this week we put out on Facebook creativity means a lot of things to a lot of people what does it mean to you and we got some responses back yeah. uh, a couple of them kind of grouped together so we we took some time and looked at them and and we have uh, a couple that speak to the idea of flow mm. um, Judy Gale wrote when I think of creativity I think fluid Free flowing and freedom. Nope. And Joel has a similar one with it. I think. Can we, we go to the, the next, next slide? slide here. <laughs> there Thanks. we go. There There's we go. Judy, and Joel. <laughs> Judy and Joel had similar things. Uh, Judy's we read. Joel's was creativity for me is connecting to the source of everything and being a channel for that energy to flow through my being and make something new. Mm. So I like that the freedom and the free flowing idea of the energies behind that. Uh, another idea that we got from our folks came from Joe Hilder and Jim Folsom. Uh, Joe talks about the creation side of stuff. She says, making something new from something else, tangible or non-tangible, your idea into a blog spot, post your vision into a painting, your knowledge into a thesis, your skill into satisfied customer, your confidence into a solution, your company's, to your company's problem, and your science degree into a, cute, a cure for cancer. It's all creativity. That's great. You know, Joel is uh, actually a, a blogger and author from Australia. And yeah. uh, 
I've got a book on her, my desk uh, that was by her, ex exercising her creativity about, uh, I think the book's title is, uh, What Not to Say to Someone with Cancer. Ah, yeah. yes. Yeah, good. So sometimes your creativity might go to what not to do yeah, as well. Exactly, yeah. what to stop doing. Yeah, yeah that, would, that would help too in yeah. a lot of instances. So thanks, Joe. She's done a lot of really good blogging for yeah. us. It'd be yeah. good to have her back. Uh, another section of folks spoke to us about the voice of the spirit mm. uh, and their true self. Uh, similar to what Donna was saying here, Donna Gentry writes, creativity is your true self coming out uh, with all your passion. Mm. So that sense of that voice of the spirit working through you to help you discover your own passions and your own calling of your true self within that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, if God is truly our creator, then, and God is the creator of our souls, then you'd think that, that creativity and the spiritual path would be finely enmeshed and uh, that the path of the true self must also be uh, the, the creative path. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's just nice to be able to think of an expansive role of what creativity is instead of just watercolors or crayons or, you know, something like that. Uh, the, the fine arts is also part of a great creativity, but it's the expression of who you are. Mm. That's the creative part underneath that. And, and I think that came through on a lot of these comments from the Yeah, folks. that's a good point. It's a lot of people think of creativity as like you must dance with feathers and tutus right. or something. And Liturgical I don't know. dance. <laughs> yeah, do, do whatever, you know. And those, those could be great creative pursuits, but not, all of, us, not yeah. all of us dance with feathers with tutus on. Right. And, uh, and yet the creative path can be um, as simple as sitting still yeah. and exploring uh, uh, you know, your, your inner, inner world. It, could be, it can take all kinds of forms. Then. And Joe talking about um, expressing yourself and who you are creatively through your vocation, through your calling in life, curing cancer. Yeah. I mean, any of that stuff is, is a creative expression of who you are and who you were called to be. Yeah. So it's, it was a good discussion, yeah. and it's a great way to start our new series. That's right. One of the things uh, we'll be covering today, or this, our central focus, will be on the first stage of the, the process that Troy li lays out, which is he labels as dreaming. And uh, he'll have more to say about that in a moment. But one of the things I think that, um, that we try to kind of keep in mind when it comes to both creativity and the spiritual path uh, is is a central question, which is, uh, is are you uh, is God living within your dream, or are you living within God's dream? You know, how you answer that question has a lot to do um, with with how happy you will be in life, how engaged you will be with this world, and how you will meet uh, the struggles that that come your way. If if God is simply a subset of your dream, exists within your dream, then uh, you set the playing field, you dictate the rules, mm -hmm. you set the, the time frame, and of course God must play on your side and is limited by the extent of your imagination and knowledge and feelings about what's acceptable and what's not. Uh, but when you let go of that and you let go into living within God's dream, the playing field gets rather expansive. Yeah, much, know. much larger. And I think we have an example of that in the Luke 4 uh, reading when Jesus comes to his hometown. I mean, they're all really impressed when he lays out God's dream. You know, free the captives, speak good news to the poor, give sight to the blind, and so forth. Uh, you know, they're pretty impressed by his chutzpah, uh, but then he actually expects them to to do something about that dream, and then all hell breaks loose. It's like, you know, that's well, yeah, you go over let, the cliff. yeah, as long as we're playing lip service to this dream, that's, that's one thing, but, you, oh, wait, you want us to do something about it? But I have to admit, you know, that, that's a lot on his list. I mean, it is. when I think about, okay, what am I going to do to, to uh, help solve poverty, help free captives, and, and help give sight to the blind and so forth, um, I get rather overwhelmed by, by solving that list. poverty that you can just do that. Oh yeah, just just like just that. Like yeah, that. We, it's kind of a little hard yeah. work. Um, but I wonder if if Jesus, when he lies out God's dream, is not. Uh, I doubt he's asking us to to just simply do all of that. But rather, um, you know, the central piece. If if your if your soul is created by God and then are therefore intrinsically connected to God, um, it seems that the first step of the whole process is to set aside what the world needs and even what God needs and simply ask, what brings you alive? What truly stirs your soul? Down on that, the deepest level. You know, on its deepest level, the soul wants to live God's dream, not simply its own. It doesn't want to simply make a paycheck. 
doesn't simply want to have a, a bit of status in the community. You know, once a, our survival needs are, are met, the soul quickly turns to higher uh, needs. Uh, the need for belonging in community, the need to be making a difference, the need to be living for a cause higher than oneself, the need to give and receive love, give grace and forgiveness and receive it. Those are the deep yearnings of the soul. And when we get in touch with that which brings us most fully alive, that, that, that strikes passion within us and compassion, that is our place within that God's wider dream. When we find that place of aliveness and then begin to treat others, the recipients of our labors in that direction, whether that be through our vocation or our avocation, treating the other, other others as if they are Jesus himself, like Jesus calls us to do, whatsoever you do the least of these you do to me, um, we begin to feel fulfilled. It's astonishing how any career, uh, whether it be auto mechanics to pediatric pulmonology, uh, actually um, helps fulfill that wider vision that Jesus talked about. Exactly. Well, coming up, uh, we'll be joined by Troy Bronsink, but uh, two things we want to take care of beforehand. One is we would really, uh, we really appreciate it when you hit that donate button from time to time. Uh, we are uh, uh, just trying to work off a $25,000 matching grant for Darkwood Brew. We're $4,000 shy, and that must be completed by the end of the year, otherwise we don't get it, which means every dollar you give is doubled. So if, you, if even a simple donation of $5 a month just goes a long way, that's every $5 is doubled, and uh, we really appreciate your, your support. Keep Starkwood Brew coming to you uh, every week. Um, now Matt has got a word of introduction for the band, and what, what are you going to be playing tonight? Well, a little later in the episode, the feature will be Chuck Maronick's Pat the Hat, and for communion, we're going to do an original piece, but I want to say hello to the fellows in the band first, Ron Cooley on the guitar, Bob O'Bennett on the drums, and Steve Gomez on the bass. Fantastic. Yeah. And as we uh, make our way towards uh, Troy, we're going to, to just uh, lift up a video that was filmed this morning by a church in Brimfield, Massachusetts. Uh, that's actually been going through Troy's book, and uh, in the first chapter, he has uh, invites us to uh, uh, simply uh, write, create a drawing, uh, one of many exercises he suggests, that illustrates uh, your dream merging with God's dream. So let's go to Brimfield, Massachusetts. So we were creative before church today, responding to wave one in the concept of dreaming doing an exercise from the drawn-in book. And some of the responses were telling. Here is a story telling about hiking the Appalachian Trail. One of our members, after he retired, hiked the entire trail in pieces. And in this piece of the trail, he met someone who at first dismissed him as another wet, miserable hiker and didn't seem to have much time for him. But as Jim got to know him better, discovered that he was one who made dreams come true for children with terminal illnesses. One of the gifts of being creative and hiking along the way and looking, being open to hearing other stories as you move along. Some other art and then this contribution. The Bunker Hill, Zakem Bunker Hill Bridge in Boston. Uh, holy oasis in the midst of all the concrete and noise. After the big dig, you now come through Boston in a hole in the ground. You emerge into this sacred space, this place of light and beauty. So it's important to find these things in pieces of our lives, and that's what we shared today. Well, thanks, uh, Ian, and the congregation of Brimf at Brimfield, Massachusetts, First Congregational Church. Look forward to hearing from you, uh, perhaps at time to time uh, during the series. Well, now we're going to turn to Troy Bronsink, who's joining us from Cincinnati, Ohio. Good to see you, Troy. Thanks, Eric. Good to see you. How are you? I'm uh, very well, thank you. And uh, kudos on your your new book. We've been uh, really enjoying this, and and uh, our congregation is actually reading it um, ourselves. Um, awesome. Yeah, and I must confess, and by the way, this is not a paid plug. <laughs> this is just an honest expression of personal appreciation. But ever since hearing your music uh, a year ago last August, um, it has just been on heavy rotation in my mind 
yeah. almost to the point where I don't like you anymore because it keeps <laughs> going through my mind because I like it so much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So yeah, uh, great, great album. And um, if if you are interested in, it, I posted on my personal Facebook page uh, just before the program. But uh, uh, that that CD is called uh, Music to Pray By. Songs to Pray By. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah no. songs to pray by. Yeah, and it's not churchy. So <laughs> I don't really like uh, a whole lot of uh, quote unquote Christian music. Um, this is this is for those of us who don't really like Christian music, but it has a, this deeply <laughs> Christian and spiritual theme all the way through. So it was fun to do. There was a uh, I worked with City Church East Side in Atlanta, so it's actually a live show, um, and then a bunch of work in the studio after that. Um, but it's been fun to work with. So. Cool. So now you have been a student of the creative process uh, for many years. Uh, what what got you into all this? Um. I mean, in some sense, as a musician and, uh, and then as a pastor, like uh, even in seminary, kind of the work of crafting things. Kind of, I think it was Joe mentioned things like when you work on a, a knowledge, it forms it into a thesis, that kind of work. I, I remember uh, kind of an aha sometime in seminary that, uh, that much of the church's work is a form of art. And, uh, and much of God's work um, in terms of what is the missional church, we're actually a, a community who is being made, being crafted. You're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Like it. So we're being crafted and we're crafting, and that relationship's a tricky one. Um, and uh, I mean, you kind of said that yourself, the dreams, um, are you part of the dream? Is God part of your dreams or are you part of God's dreams? And uh, uh, so I think uh, I began to see some parallels between the creative process, even beginning with books like uh, The Artist's Way or books from uh, Elizabeth O'Connor and other uh, other um, mystics talking about the creative life and seeing how similar that was to things I was uh, discovering about design thinking. Um, Buckminster Fuller, uh, who designed the geodesic dome, you know, the big Epcot ball, yeah. um, among other things, he, he kind of coined the phrase design thinking um, or design sciences. And he was saying, um, when you build something, you build with a vision in mind. And, and in fact, if you want the user to go through a different type of experience, you build a different type of environment. And I started realizing this is what music is like, creating that type of environment. This is what um, all sorts of art forms um, do. They create something with an expectation that it ties into a, to a bigger thing, something you want to accomplish or make happen. Um, and so uh, I started seeing the way that spiritual formation and design thinking have some similar rhythms. Mm. Um, I first read a book by uh, an author who's a professor now at Claremont, um, uh, Mihaila Shiksent Mihaila, and he, he wrote a book called Flow that was really popular. Mm -hmm. And in there, he talked about the creative process and what it means to be in the flow. Some of your, uh, some of the readers had kind of yeah, said that on the on Facebook that, yeah, page. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, and I realized that this is a lot like what the mystics would talk about um, yes. in terms of our prayer life and our being present. Even that uh, Brother Lawrence and the. Um, the practice of the presence of God. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I began to see some parallels to this. So a lot of folks write about processes, but, uh, but I began to see um, that these are really fun to play with both of these, especially when we think of how creativity and beauty plays a role um, in our faith and in our church communities and in our everyday life, um, kind of an, a rising awareness of design thinking and uh, even the DIY kind of do-it-yourself approach to life, how is that also like our spiritual life and our spiritual rhythms, our regular spiritual practices? Yeah. I know one of the, one of the things I, found, I find helpful about looking at the mystical works, too, is, is that you know, when we talk about flow, you know, they, they noted that you know, that kind of sense of flow is it, kind of the impediments to flow, too, is, which is fear and how we kind of live on this, this balance between fear and flow. Uh, in our life, and that when yeah. we have a high fear, we're actually, it's the surest block to that, that sense of flow. Um, yet, it seems like um, in the Christian church, we don't really, um, we don't really associate Christianity or, or you know, church life with creativity very much. It seems to be almost an expectation that's not that creative. Uh, why do you suppose that is? I mean, I think there's kind of a, there's a number of different ways when we try to talk about the the engagement with the sacred, we create some boundaries around those things that are sacred. We, we see a burning bush, but then we put a memorial in front of the burn, burning bush and say, <laughs> this is where we visited and we're visited by God. And, uh, and so that's a regular habit of religion and, and society. But I think we often uh, um, then find ourselves uh, um, afraid of other people's burning bushes ending up in, a, in the church with us, because then it's harder to domesticate and, and even make the church gathering work or a Bible study work or 
a relationship if there's always new things coming in that you can't quite give a name to. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that that might be one one reason. Um, yeah. I think we also we talk a lot about vision, you know, in church, um, and uh, especially I, I grew up in a tradition where we'd talk about a visionary leader, you know, and somebody with really strong vision, and then you'd say, here's what the vision for this church is, and sometimes you have companies talk about vision that way, um, but uh, but recognizing that that what God is doing in the world is not always something we can totally see. It's not within our total vision. Mm. And so, uh, so it's kind of threatening to, for, when, for somebody to say, here's my vision, and for somebody else to say, well, what if God's up to more than that? Right. Um, right. What, if there, what if we haven't seen everything? Um, it, that's kind of threatening to the mo- potential momentum. Yeah. I think that often hits churches as well. Yeah, I wonder if sometimes people can capitalize on the fact that not everything that God is doing is seen by us too, and actually insert visions that would uh, that actually counter um, that that path that God wants us on. I, you know, I, I wrote, I remember um, when I wrote the book um, uh, Asphalt Jesus, I put I put in a certain chapter of this really controversial thing that the, that the publisher made me take out. But it was <laughs> it was actually a, a reflection on if, if I were Satan, how I would completely mess up everything uh, that Christianity was trying to stand for. And I, I said that I w- all I would do um, of all the range of possibilities is only one thing. I would only ask for one thing, and that is I would insert into the human consciousness the idea, not, the, not even the knowledge, just simply the idea that possibly the God of their understanding, um, if you do not please this God in a certain way, that you would be tortured forever in some sort of eternal punishment. <laughs> And because uh, not, I've, I've heard that one before, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it basically unravels everything if you start thinking through, and including inserts the very kind of fear that absolutely blocks the flow. And, and if God is our creator, and creativity is the way that we in, interact with our creator, mm-hmm. uh, then it just puts the, the kibosh on there's all always, that. There's always can, like, kind of this sense of, someone looking over your shoulder. And yeah. so uh, that inner critic becomes actually, uh, you, you almost create a God out of the inner critic. Whatever you're afraid of getting wrong, whether that was something you learned in uh, art class in fifth grade because you drew a, a head that was lopsided and somebody said, that's not a head. And, <laughs> or, right. or, you know, the first time you, you got into your workplace and suddenly were threatened and you said some things that kind of set everything up. At each point, those voices keep coming back and, uh, and I think we often get kind of log jammed in the creative process because of that inner critic that, uh, that begins to, uh, to speak. And I think often in church we allow, I, I'll speak for myself, often in my life as a Jesus follower, I found myself attributing that inner critic um, to a conscience or to God. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know that it's always that case. You have to do disciplines and practice to get that inner critic free in many times. Absolutely. And in fact, even God has to do that. I mean, I, you know, I've <laughs> long been uh, curious by the fact that in the Old Testament, the most frequent uh, words on God's ma- out of God's mouth in the Old Testament is al-tirah in Hebrew, do not fear. So even yeah. God's got to jump in and say, hey, no, no, that voice, not me. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Get, mm-hmm. You know, open up, dream a little with me. Yeah. Dream, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have uh, in your book you uh, talk about really six uh, processes, which you call waves, uh, that are involved in in becoming more creative. Uh, what are those? If, if we could just give a thumbnail sketch uh, to kind of yeah. set things up, uh, what are those six processes? I mean, there's a number of different ways folks have kind of lined this stuff out, but yeah. uh, but if you look at them kind of in a um, a sense of everything begins at a dream stage, mm. and uh, and it's in that place of dreaming that you uh, that you you sit and go. The sky's the limit. You can really blue sky, and we'll actually talk more about dreaming later on in this in this session. Sure. But uh, um, there's this dreaming, and and then you have to actually begin to do the focusing work of saying, after having blue sky, here's what I'm going to work on right now. And uh, and a songwriter's got to do that kind of work. A teacher has to do that kind of work. You have to begin to focus. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters of creation, doing that same kind of work. Mm. Um, the Spirit of God that uh, that uh, settled over Mary and when she became uh, with child. The Spirit of God over uh, young David um, 
when uh, Samuel was looking who would be the next king. Um, uh, there's always this hovering, this sense of kind of a halo put on an experience that says, I'm going to work with this one. And then as you work on that process, you have to eventually then take a risk. You have to jump out and, and try. And uh, in the design process, this is called rapid prototyping. It's just little little attempts kind of breaking through that barrier through that you talked about those fears breaking through those fears with just little steps um, those little risks get the paint on the page on the canvas and begin to see what comes of it um, but then what happens after having taken that risk you have to um, begin to listen to the medium mm -hmm. um, you can often hear uh, um, I, th I think uh, Johnny Cash, when he wrote that song, When the Man Comes Around, that uh, I think he said there was something like 60-some verses that he wrote for that um, before kind of settling in and going, which ones speak to me? And the ones that jump out, you kind of interact with. And I, I think the same thing's true in our, uh, in our life of tending after our spirit life, um, our full embodied life, that, uh, that we listen to the others around us, that discernment process. What are, what are others saying? And as I'm quiet, what do I even hear in that quiet? Mm -hmm. What voices of my own are rising up that I can dismiss? Um, and how is God's presence something that I hear in there? What does that give me courage towards? Um, and after you've done that listening, then you move into a uh, uh, reintegrating period where you put what you've created in um, concert with other things. And you can think of this... Uh, um, as a sculptor or a glass blower might decide to have a whole installation of, of many different pieces. How do they fit together? And there's some you don't put there because they just no longer fit. Um, but you begin to see the whole um, piece uh, together. And I think God is frequently reminding us of that kind of work. That uh, we had World Communion Sunday. Uh, we celebrated that in our uh, congregation this morning here at, uh, in Cincinnati. And, uh, and there were drummers from uh, a variety of... Uh, faith traditions that were part of this time. And as we were talking about the passage of the Syrophoenician woman and all this was taking place, you realized there's a bigger story that can be told here than Presbyterian church at 1115 on Sunday morning. <laughs> what? Are you kidding yeah, me? I know. So, so, so that reintegrating work, it, it addresses our You hubris. heard it here at Darkwood Brew, folks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that reintegrating work um, really challenges our own hubris, our sense of like we're the only game in town. Um, it's a real challenge to new church development organizers in a community. Like there's other, there may be other churches or other things happening in the community. Does this even matter for that, uh, mm -hmm. for the rest of the community that's around you? Um, it matters as a pastor or any type of uh, professional or artist with kids. And you come home and you go, how do I integrate this life of creativity where there's an ocean of possibilities sw swelling at me? And getting the dinner on the table in the next 20 minutes. And yeah. all of that, that, that type of present mindfulness is really important. Absolutely. But then there's a point when you've got it all together, so that's the fifth one, where, th where then you step back and you can rest. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, in the Christian uh, tradition, we, we're, we've been taught a lot through the Jewish tradition about Sabbath, mm -hmm. and different folks have sabbatical rhythms and those kind of things in their life. Um, but you also can have these weekly rhythms. You can have these during the day with regular practices of examen or um, Lectio Divina or other practices where you just stop and rest. And uh, when you aren't trying to manage a project and it can kind of um, percolate on the back burner, what's amazing is then you find yourself dreaming again. And, uh, and so the cycle repeats itself. And this can happen over the course of our hour together. This can happen over the course of a lifetime or a, um, a, a, you know, your church's lifetime, a, a number of different things. Yeah, that's right. But we are going to actually uh, experience a form of that rest that you just mentioned uh, just now, and then we'll come back to you a little later uh, to develop it. But uh, at the central centerpiece of every Dark Wood Brew episode, in case you're joining us for the first time, is this, uh, uh, we call it Numa Divina. It's, it's our take on the ancient Lectio Divina. You uh, already heard uh, the full expression of the scripture passage up front in our episode. Now we're simply going to narrow uh, the passage down to Luke 4, verses 13 through 21. You're going to hear three passes at that passage over the next several minutes. And each time we'll have uh, some suggestions about ways to interact with that passage in your own inner world, to kind of rest with it, to contemplate it, and to open yourself up to spiritual insight, which might happen right in the next few minutes, or open yourself up to receiving spiritual insight from this passage later on today or even uh, tomorrow. So uh, this, uh, we encourage you to, um, even if you're accessing this episode uh, later on in recorded mode or on our podcast, 
actually to take this, ep this exercise seriously, it has proven over 1,500 years of practice to help <coughs> us stir those deeper waters within us and open us to, to creative insight. The first time you're going to hear this passage now, uh, we simply invite you to listen for a word or phrase that sticks in your mind. Right, and we find that word or phrase, simply consider every iteration of that word or phrase in your life. Every kind of uh, way of expressing that word or phrase that you can find in your everyday experience. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This next time you hear the, the passage, we invite you to take that word or <coughs> phrase that you had identified in that first reading and do one of two things. If there is a question that you happen to bring to the episode tonight, something that was bothering you, uh, that you were stewing on, hold up that word or phrase to that question that was stirring you before the episode uh, began. Uh, otherwise, simply ask yourself, uh, what does that word or phrase, what is it trying to tell you uh, about your own path at this particular time? When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, 
Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now this final pass of the scripture, we simply invite you after hearing it to continue the conversation either that uh, had opened up in that last reading or simply to set it all aside and come to rest in God's presence, clearing out anything that may be on your mind and simply enjoying that presence. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. as we step into our musical feature uh, for the evening, we invite you to uh, continue to contemplate that passage, or if you have uh, questions or comments you'd like to place online, ask uh, Troy or myself about, we invite you to log those in now, and also uh, from the coffee house, if you have questions or comments you'd like to make, uh, Tracy, just signal to Tracy here, and we'll be uh, uh, in conversation with Troy after our musical uh, feature.
by Chuck Moronic. Great. Well, uh, Troy, it's good to have you back again. And uh, I just want to turn to that, that Numa Divina passage. In your own experience of that passage, was there any uh, particular line or phrase that jumped out for you? Yeah, um, that, uh, that, pa that part, uh, as was his regular practice, mm. um, that, one, uh, that one jumped out at me. The uh, thinking about uh, you know, dreams, how does he sit with um, this story regularly, you know, and, and in a sense, it's like, it's almost like once upon a time, it's kind of almost like a once upon a time kind of image. Like it was his regular practice. Like it could have been any day during his regular practice, but this day the vision grabbed him apparently. And mm. it was enough for him to say, here, yeah, here's my, here's my part in this. And I'm going to say it right now mm. um, because of that regular practice. I, Fascinating. So maybe even the suggestion there that for Jesus himself, it just wasn't always constant creativity. You know that, that uh -huh. I mean, could have been too. Um, probably more creativity than than we experience. But there are those times where you simply have to put in your time. You know, before that well, flash yeah, of mean, insight he, comes. He would always go off to these lonely places to pray, and so like some of the dreaming sure is is that Sabbath part of resting. But I, I think it's also like. It's an unbusied space. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's now in that. Yeah, now in has said, uh, discipline in the Christian life is making space in which God can act. Space in which you're neither occupied or preoccupied. Mm -hmm. um, so it was great to have that practice, the Numa Divina. I mean, it, in a sense, without those centering practices, our work becomes. Uh, uh, it creates its own momentum, and it's driven by those fears. I think it's also driven by ego a lot of times, mm. um, which is sometimes a mask of fear. I, I, not always, but. Um, and so without those, those places where we decouple ourselves from the project enough to see what, what is possible and what could emerge, um, uh, without that, um, then we just just – plug through creating things and, and we're cranking things out and it's an assembly line type of life. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just thinking about also what you said about that kind of that need to kind of the, the regular practice, how uh, when it comes to dreaming God's dream, then, you know, we, we kind of think, well, God, if I get God's dream, that's exciting and all. But there is a, there is a certain amount of plotting that we have to do that, that kind of showing up regularly where nothing may be apparently happening. And then, you know, <laughs> Bam, it hits us. I remember in seminary, um, I there, had a, a professor of theology who, you know, went to the lectures for about an hour and a half with him uh, about three days a week. And um, most of the lectures I completely forgot about, but I learned that once a week, <laughs> once a week, you could just count on it, he would say one thing that would just completely zap you and you would remember for years afterwards. Uh -huh. And so, you know, sitting through a, a lot of lecturing that didn't really zap me, was okay because I knew that I could regularly count on that, you know, that creative burst of insight uh, at least and once a week with him, um, and that's a lot. Think a lot with uh, dreaming God's dream or, or attending to that dreaming path, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, we probably don't know that we're a part of the unfolding story. Mm. Um, I mean, I saw you say something like that in the comments about that today. This today, this has been fulfilled in your in your presence. Like that began to be offensive to people there. Like, wait, this is a story that we've we've always read, and one day it'll be taken care of. And Jesus is like, no, right now it's you know right here it's it's unfolding. Mm -hmm. But I think that that same threat 
um, that can be threatening to us, that this conversation right now um, is participating in the dance of God's love. That, uh, you know, in the, in the way that the, uh, you know, it's often described in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this kind of dance um, of mutual submission, that there's a type of love that is intended for all creation. And we're actually doing exactly what's been intended. We're listening to one another. We're, we're, we're participating in this. And so to actually dream and go, what might we do together? Mm. What might I make with this pen and this paper? What mm. would I make with this, uh, with this family in the next year that we have together with the kids? And, or whatever those things are, what would I make with this? Um, and really open up and say, uh, I don't know all, I, all there is to know about this. So what could there be? How could I be surprised? Where's the wonder? Yeah, um, yeah that's right. Yeah, that, the passage that jumped out to me was that last uh, piece today, this scripture has been fulfilled in, in your hearing. And I, I suddenly found myself wondering um, about, you know, when, we, when, we, when there's God's dream, um, there probably is a sense in which that dream is already fulfilled, at least within God. And if we are all kind of moving towards God in some way, especially if, you, if, you, uh, if you're no longer holding a belief that this God, if you don't please this God in a certain way, you're going to be cast into fire for all eternity. But actually, if we are all uh, in some fashion uh, moving into God's embrace in some way, um, then perhaps there is a place within God in which some of our struggles against each other or the other struggles that we experience in this life are already resolved. And, mm -hmm. and the path to... The, uh, you know, the creative path becomes actually not just struggling to create something like devise something that does not exist, but actually let uh, to unfold into something that already exists within God and now bringing that into the reality of the world. I've experienced this and I've heard sing, uh, songwriters talk about this, that place where the song writes itself. Mm, yeah. um, and, and I think the same thing can happen in, a, in reconciling communities uh, in, in the ways that forgiveness can be exchanged, like forgiveness actually could write itself. It, it, it is what's intended um, to be our destined future, that all things are being made new, that all things will be reconciled. There's no, no longer a separating barrier. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this passion that we read in the, in the New Testament by the apostles of, of a new creation, all things. Um, so then at this point, you kind of throw something up to the other and discover that there's already an attraction, there's already a momentum in which that freedom naturally will flow into God's purposes. And so certainly there are ways we self-sabotage that, and we'll talk about that some of these other, other cycles, but I think in the dreaming phase, we self-sabotage it by cutting it short yes. and going, this is it, this is the extent of my dream, the extent of my life, the extent of my, my capacity. And at the dreaming place, you have to start going, well, well what else is there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I thought back to a time in Arizona when a group of us clergy had been working very hard for LGBT equality and and were you know, for for several years. And then uh, a theologian came um, and visited us uh, to speak on the issue. It was uh, actually uh, Jack Spong, Bishop Jack Spong, and he said something that just electrified us. He said, "You know, folks, the battle for LGBT equality is actually already over. I mean, the the, the war is finished. It's already been resolved. We're just in the mopping up operation." <laughs> and that really changed our vision of what was going on and, and, and the energy. Instead of this trudging, oh, is this ever going to happen? We realized, well, no, actually, um, you know, if that's true, that, 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 that this has actually been resolved for the major point. And he was saying this about 2001. He was very prescient you know, about what's going on today. Um, yeah. We would actually turn our energy from you know, building this hard, you know, hard, this hard work to actually going with the flow, trying to, to claim a flow of energy that was already there for us to claim. Um, well, Troy, we, yeah, have I, a, uh, we have a couple of questions that have been waiting for you. One from the, the coffee house here. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Kelsey, who is a writer with the Chicago Tribune, who's visiting uh, Darkwood Brew uh, this evening. All right. So, Kelsey, you have a question for us. Yes, I do. Um, we've been talking about creativity on an individual basis, and um, I was wondering, uh, where's God in a collaborative creative process, such as a group project? Mm, great question. Oh, great, great. You know, I think that uh, Peter, Peter Block writes some interesting things about community as the structure of belonging, how a community shapes, uh, shapes vision together. Um, and I, I, think, I think he's on to something there. We often think that... Uh, strong visionary is going to say, here's how we'll all collaborate. You grab the pencils, you grab the paper, who's going to, uh, who's going to make sure there's pizza. Like 
but a lot of times there's a discernment process where a community listens to one another. Um, and I think that that can happen in the, in a creative cycle. I, I've seen, uh, there's a, a story I tell in the book of, uh, moving in the spirit, which is a dance company in Atlanta and the process they use to design their modern dance and the kids that are, um, from a variety of backgrounds, some of them, uh, situations considered at risk and, and how they together decide to tell their story in that crafting work of listening to the story and then deciding together, how are we going to shape this in our modern dance? And then there's a place where you have to begin the editing process together, which is, which is the challenge. That's the problem. If you let everybody dream and you think that that's the great happy moment, everybody dreams something together, but it's completely unrealistic. At a certain point you have to go, well, what are we going to do with the half hour we have? <laughs> um, so yeah. that's a, that's a big piece. You know, the Quakers also do some really good community discernment mm, work yeah. in terms of spiritual practices, and uh, and I think there's a, a real similarity there as well. Yeah, the Quakers almost uh, their practice of sitting in silence until somebody feels moved to say something by the Spirit, then everybody focuses around what was said, and then you know, somebody else maybe f at, moved to add to that. Actually, uh, has a lot of parallels in improv the improv acting process where you know the improvisational actors yeah, they have absolutely. a principle it's it's a yes and principle you never contradict what somebody has thrown out there you actually take what's been given and you add to it you know to me that that speaks to that that group creative process too times when it really gets good yeah well uh, Troy we also have a question that's been uh, uh, fielded from our internet chat community uh, Chris what do you have for, for Troy well the question is along those same lines of collaboration, but specifically in the idea of worship. How do you incorporate mm. these ideas of creativity into what Norelle calls, uh, Norelle is our friend that's on every week with us from Australia, and she, she's saying, how do you incorporate some of this stuff into what is a very boring, boring kind of lectionary liturgical setting that is a traditional setting that needs new life, needs fresh life, and can, can bring mm. it alive into ways that make all of us open up our imaginations and breathe a little de deeper. I think that telling a community that they're co-creators of the worship gathering is a is is something you can say, but then you have to figure out how to practice that. Um, and uh, we've actually been experimenting with that here in Cincinnati at a church that's 50 years old, a 10-year-old contemporary service, and um, a lot of what they were used to was being designed. Um, during the week and then performed from the stage and everybody would evaluate it at the end and go, oh, I really loved that or I didn't like that this week. But there was a, it was a hard for folks to get their mind around the fact that we were making it together. And so some of the ways that that's done are um, simple ways you can do that with a community are, are um, lectionary groups where you can get your community together to read these texts in advance and to think about those texts as a group. Um, and if, you're, if you get to be a pastor or a worship leader, you can actually include the comments and feedback of those folks during the course of your worship gathering um, in some really interesting ways. Uh, you can also ask folks ahead of time as they're kind of unpacking this, what other art and other forms of media does this remind them of? And so suddenly the, uh, the other supporting materials um, become uh, kind of connected together and you have a chance to reference this and say, oh, this was, a, this was something Barb Smucker pointed out or this is something that we heard from Deb Shelton or whatever because these other artists are providing that, uh, that sort of input. Um, uh, Todd Fadel, who's at a church in Portland called The Bridge, uh, he has a little church, a uh, little um, band called The Agents of the Future. He has this project um, of songwriting, particularly, where you bring folks together, you do something like the Numa Divina, and begin to uh, look for words or phrases that stick out, and then you go, what are potential titles for songs? And then you have that group together make a song one at a time for five minutes. Different people make a song and conduct everybody else. These are, this is just for the musicians kind of that want to play like this. But in that improv, like you were talking about, Eric, there's a, there's a place where you listen, learn to listen to one another. And even if those songs don't become standards that you'll use in your worship gathering, you begin to develop within the band and then you, de you develop this at other layers with one another, a sense of listening where folks are appreciating and hearing how one another are, uh, are a part of the voice of God in their community. Mm, great insights. Well, Troy, we're really looking forward to uh, having you back uh, throughout this series. You've, uh, I think uh, everybody who has not been familiar with you uh, is getting an idea why uh, we were wanting to experience more of you than just one, uh, one, one tap on the shoulder. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next week as we, we explore the concept of hovering, uh, that second wave of the, the creative process. Uh, 
thanks. Yeah. Looking forward to it, Eric. Oh. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber, who's got a, an interesting community in, uh, in Denver, Colorado, called the Church of All Sinners and Saints, uh, makes an observation on a, on a, a DVD called Animate Faith, uh, in which she talks about her uh, experience of her friends who say, you know, I don't really need church because I kind of find God within myself and, and in my own inward self, so I don't really need all this, this stuff outside of myself to, to lead my spiritual life. Uh, to which Nadia always finds herself responding, oh my God, I need something beyond simply myself because my vision is so limited and, and restricted and sometimes hysterical and sometimes ego-driven and so forth. I need something that is beyond simply Nadia. You know? When I think about this meal that we celebrate at Darkwood Brew every week, uh, known as communion, um, I start thinking, you know, if it were up to Eric Elmas to determine what Christian faith is all about, we would never be celebrating this meal. I mean, we would, it never would have happened because I uh, never would have let this happen to Jesus in my dream. If in my dream, uh, Jesus would have been perfectly well accepted by all of us and, and, you know, and, and we just would have had a love fest together. Um, and yet, um, somehow, some way, um, you know, God uh, you know, trumps our, the limits of our imagination, the limits even of what we consider to be acceptable uh, in, in our experience of life. And this ritual is something likely none of us would have chosen uh, for Jesus. This the, the representing a path that none of us would have chosen and yet um, fills us so deeply in that innermost well in which we remind, we're reminded on a night in which Jesus was betrayed and deserted. He took bread and he, he said to his friends, uh, my friends, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. So likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, My friends, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. And we come to know in this experience of Jesus, of all the experiences we could ever have wanted for him, this experience tells us most centrally that deep within the heart of God, there is knowledge of a pain that is akin to a parent losing an only child. And therefore, God understands the deepest and fullest extent of our pain. It also shows that the deep in the heart of God, that God is able to transform pain into a new beginning. Now, I never would have asked for Jesus' path to be filled with such pain, such desolation. And yet, it's because God chose this path to be part of God's story, not simply my little dream story. I know that no, there is nothing, nothing in this world that can separate you or me from the transformative love of God in Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God. If you happen to have, be join us this evening, have bread and wine or juice and crackers to share, we invite you to join us in this meal, this feast, the bread of life, the cup of blessing.
Well, we appreciate your joining us this evening at Darkwood Brew and look forward to uh, joining you in the coming weeks as we round out the series uh, uh, Drawn In, Living Out the Creative Life uh, with God with Troy Bronzink. Next week, as I mentioned, hover. God's hovering, our hovering. What does that mean in the creative process? Well, until then, my friends, may the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go above you to watch over you. Go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself. Go beneath you to uphold you and uplift you. Go beside you to be your strong companion. And dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone. You are part of God's dream. And because of this, you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you, now and always. Amen.